Welcome back to Key Philosophies. Today we're going to continue with Chapter 1 of Matrix 3. Psychosocial, chemical, biological manipulation of human consciousness. We're going to finish this Chapter 1. And this part will start with human etheric structures. There is nothing in the manifest universe which does not possess an energy form, subtle and intangible, yet substantial, which controls, governs, and conditions the physical. With reference to the physical body, it is termed the etheric body. This energy form is itself conditioned and governed by the dominant solar or planetary energy, which ceaselessly creates it, changes, and qualifies it. The etheric body, in the vast energy, the mass of the human the mass of humanity are still Atlantean or astral in their nature. The etheric body is composed of interlocking and circulating lines of force emanating from the many levels of consciousness of our planetary life. These lines of energy and the this closely interlocking system of streams of force are related to seven focal points or centers to be found within the etheric body. Each of these centers are related to certain types of incoming energy when the energy reaching the etheric body is not related to a particular center. That center remains passive. When it is related to the center when it is related and the center is sensitive to its impact then that center becomes vibrant and receptive and develops as a controlling factor in the life of the man on the physical plane. The dense physical body is held together by and is expressive of the energies which compose the etheric body. These energies appear to be of two types, the energies which form through interlocking lines, the underlying etheric body, as a whole and in relation to all physical forms, this form is qualified then by the general life and vitality of the plane on which the dweller in the body functions, and therefore where his consciousness is normally focused. Another type of energy is the particular energies which, by which the individual consciously chooses to govern his daily activities as attitude attainment and comprehension shift to higher levels the etheric body will be constantly changing and responding to newer energies the etheric body interpenetrates underlies and occupies the entire physical organism it extends beyond the physical form and surrounds it like an aura according to the point in evolution will be the area which the etheric body covers beyond the outside of the physical body. It may extend for a few or many inches. Within the physical body, the network of the etheric body is to be found permeating every single part. It is particularly associated at this time with the nervous system, which is fed, nourished, controlled, and galvanized by its etheric counterpart. This counterpart is present in millions of tiny streams or lines of energy, to which the Eastern occultist has given the name nadis. These nadis are the carriers of energy. They are in fact the energy itself and carry the quality of energy from some area of consciousness in which the dweller in the body may happen to be focused. According to the state of consciousness and the psychic state of awareness, so will be the type of energy carried by the nadis. Passing from them to the outer nervous system. And you'll see an illustration here. The seven layer auric body system. I'll notice seven being used in many religious systems and uh, I think a lot of that re really truly relates to this and um, as we go through other material I think that will become evident 
So we have the etheric body, the mental aspect, celestial body, emotional aspect, etherical template, the physical aspect, astral body, heart center, mental body, lower mental aspect, emotional body, lower emotional aspect, and eth and etheric body, lower etheric aspect. So this would be like your 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 aromatic space here. So you have the physical plane. The astral plane and the spiritual plane. So, these are what these areas relate to the seven layers, the seven chakras, auric system. You'll see the, the aura and the spiral. Like Taoist teachings. Montauk Chia. Continuing, it, it must always be remembered that the seven energy centers are not within the dense physical body. They exist only in etheric matter and in the etheric so-called aura outside the physical body. They are closely related to the dense physical body by the network of nadis. Five of the centers are to be found in the etheric counterpart of the spinal column and the energy passes through the spinal vertebrae and circulates then through the etheric body as it is interiorly active within the physical vehicle. Three head centers exist, one just above the top of the head, another just in front of the eyes and forehead, and the third at the back of the head, just above where the spinal column ends. In practice, the center at the back of the head is not counted in the initiation process any more than is the spleen. So we have the seven centers to examine. The powerful effect of the inflow of energy via the energy body has itself automatically created these centers or reservoirs of force. The effect of these seven centers upon the physical body in due time produces condensation or a state of what is called attracted response from dense matter. And thus, the seven major sets of endocrine glands slowly come into functioning activity. The whole development of the etheric body falls into two historical stages. The first stage is that in which the etheric energy flowing through responsive centers and creating endocrine glands as a consequence gradually begin to have a definite effect upon the bloodstream. The energy worked through that medium solely for a very long time. This still remains true for the life aspect of energy animates the blood through the medium of the centers and their agents, the glands. Hence, the words in the Bible that the blood is the life. Secondly, as the race of men developed and consciousness grew greater and certain great expansions took place, the centers began to extend their usefulness and to use the nadis and thus to work upon and through the nervous system. This produced conscious and planned activity upon the physical plane. The energy tubules or nadis pass to certain areas of the body in three ways through the seven major centers, through the 21 minor centers, through 49 focal points scattered all over the body. The physical body, therefore, is triple in design. There is the etheric body, the nada system, and the dense physical body. Telepathic activity. Telepathic activity appears to be present in three modes in developing human beings. Instinctual telepathy is based upon those impacts of energy which come from one etheric body and make an impression upon another. The medium of communication employed is the etheric substance of all bodies, which is necessarily one with the etheric substance of the planet. The areas around the solar plexus are sensitive to the impact of etheric energy. For this area in the etheric body, is in direct touch, as it were, with the astral body. The feeling body also, close to the solar plexus, is found 
that centered near the spleen, which is the direct instrument for the entrance of prana into the human mechanism. Prana might be defined as the life essence, this instinctual response to etheric contact is said to be the mode of communication in the Lemurian times. A largely, and largely, took the place of thought and speech. It concerned itself primarily with two types of impressions, that which had to do with the instinct of self-preservation and that which had to do with self-reproduction. A higher form of this instinctual telepathy has been preserved for us in the expression we so frequently use, I have a feeling that, and allied phrases. These are more definitely astral in their implications and work through astral substance. Using the solar plexus area as a sensitive plate for impact and impression, this astral, not etheric, sensitivity or feeling telepathy also basically the Atlantean mode of communication and involved, finally, the use of the solar plexus center itself as the receiving agent. The emitting agent worked, however, through the entire area of the diaphragm and was as though there appeared a gathering of outgoing waveforms in that part of the human vehicle. The relatively wide area from which the information was sent out acted as a large general distributor. The area which received the impression was more localized, involving only the solar plexus. The reason for this can be found in the fact that in the Atlantean days, the human being was still unable to think, as we understand thinking. The whole lower part of the body, in the sense difficult for us to grasp, was given up to feeling. The communicator's one thought contribution was the name of the recipient, plus the name or noun form of that which was the idea to be conveyed. This embryonic thought winged its way to its goal, and the powerful feeling apparatus of the solar plexus received it and drew the feeling impression there. Drawing on the communicator, it is this process which is pursued when, for instance, some mother feels that some danger threatens her child or that something is taking place in connection with her child. Instinctual telepathy will often manifest in two ways. It will be from the solar plexus to solar plexus between two people who are ordinary, emotional, governed by desire, primary, primarily centered in the astral or animal bodies. In addition, it will be between such a solar plexus person and another whose solar plexus center is functioning actively, but whose throat center is also active. This type of person registers in two places, providing that the thought sense and the thought sensed and sent out by the solar plexus person has in it something of mental substance or energy. Pure feeling or entirely emotional emanations between people necessitate only solar plexus contact. Intellectual telepathy has also been referred to as sympathetic telepathy, which involves a sense of immediate understanding, awareness of events or apprehensions of happenings, and identification with personality reactions. The entire process involves the lower aspect of the universal mind as an agent. Mental telepathy. <clears throat> Today, instinctual telepathy communication is still the major expression, but at the same time, mental telepathy is becoming increasingly prevalent. The throat center is primarily involved where mental telepathy is concerned. There is also sometimes a little heart center activity and always a measure of solar plexus reaction. Hence our problem. Frequently, the communicator will send a message via the throat center, and the recipient will still use the solar plexus. Mental telepathy is the rapport established between minds. It also includes the telepathic response to current thought forms and thought conditions in the world today. Mental telepathy could also be termed the interplay of transmitted thought. It is related to the higher aspect of the universal mind, to the intelligent will. Straight mental telepathy 
is one of the highest demonstrations of the personality. It is in the nature of a bridging faculty, for it is one of the major steps towards a higher impression. It always presupposes a relatively high stage of mental development. A strong desire to achieve success in telepathic work and the fear of failure are the surest ways to offset fruitful effort. In all such work as this, an attitude of non-attachment and a spirit of don't care are of real assistance. Emotion and the desire for anything on the part of the receiver create streams of energy which rebuff or repulse that which seeks to make contact, such as the direct thought of someone seeking report. When these streams are adequately strong, they act like a boomerang and return to the emanating center, being attracted back there by the power of the vibration which sent them forth. In other words, intense desire to make a satisfactory impression will attract the outgoing back again to the transmitter. You can see, therefore, how a cultivation of detachment is, necess is a necessary qualification for success in telepathic work. And I'll say many, uh, many other things. Intuitional telepathy. Intuitional telepathy is one of the developments upon the paths of the initiate. The area involved is the head and the throat and the three centers which will be rendered active in the process are the head center, which is receptive to impressions from higher sources, and what is called the Ajna center, which is receptive to intuitional impressions. This Ajna center between the eyebrows can then broadcast what which is received and recognized. Using the throat center as the creative formulator of thought and the factor which embodies the sensed or intuited idea, the truly telepathic individual is one who is responsive to impressions coming to him from all forms of life. Intuitional telepathy begins to manifest increasingly among advanced human beings. This indicates soul contact and the consequent awakening of group consciousness. For sensitivity to intuitional impressions has to do only with group concerns. Group telepathic work. The course of evolution is taking the human species toward eventual work together as a group where telepathic work is concerned. There are several factors which appear to govern united group telepathic work. First, it is essential as a member of a group that is evolving in consciousness and working on telepathic levels that you acquire faculty in tuning in on each other with deepest love and understanding, that you develop in personality so that when a brother tunes in on what he perceives is a weakness or a strength, it evokes in you no reaction that could upset the harmony of the group. The discovery of what is perceived as a weakness should produce only the evocation of a deeper love. If individuals cannot tune in on each other with ease after long periods of close relationship, how can they, as a group, tune in on some individual or some group of individuals unknown to them in their personalities? Secondly, constant effort must be carried forth to bring about a group love of such strength that nothing can break it and no barriers rise up between you to cultivate a group sensitivity of such a quality that your diagnosis of conditions will be relatively accurate to develop and unfold a group ability to work as a unit so that there will be nothing in the inner attitudes of group member which could break into their carefully established rhythm. Thirdly, any group working along telepathic lines must be carefully controlled. Any group effort which seeks to impress the mind of any subject, whether an individual or a group, must be guarded as to motive, 
and method. Any group endeavor which involves a united applied effort to effect changes in the point of view, an outlook on life, or a technique of living must be utterly selfless. Most wisely and cautiously undertaken, and must be kept free from any personality emphasis, any personality pressure, and any mental pressure, which is formulated in terms of mental belief, prejudice, dogmatism, or ideas. The result of all true telepathic work and rightly directed effort to impress a subject will be to leave him with a strengthened will to right action. An intensified interior light as astral body freer from the idea of glamour. And a physical body more vital and purer. The potency of a united group activity is powerful. The occult aphorism that energy follows thought is either a statement of truth or else a meaningless phrase. The Induction of Telepathic States by Ingestion of Substances Several years ago, it was rumored that some companies in Canada had produced a substance which, if ingested, gave individuals telepathic abilities. This was reported in 1990 in The Leading Edge in some detail. Obviously, the Canadian government stopped the company from continuing business. There are, however, natural substances that are reported to enhance telepathic ability, and one of those substances comes from the woody vine known as ayahuasca which is found in Brazil. The vine contains a number of alkaloids and psychoactive properties, one of which has been called telepatin, because it seems to turn those around you into glass, so that you can see through their bodies and read their minds. Lyall Watson, author of Beyond Supernatural, tried it and vouches for this apparent effect, and most interesting thing about ayahuasca is that it appears to have chameleon qualities. It is a door which opens a variety of landscapes, connecting an individual to information sources in the animal kingdom. Telepathic sensitivity. Telepathic sensitivity should be and always is a normal unfoldment when the individual is correctly oriented and completely dedicated. If it is a forced process, then development does not occur correctly. Where the individual on a path of conscious initiation is concerned, release from the constant consideration of personal circumstances and problems leads inevitably to a clear mental release. This then provides areas of free mental perception which make the higher sensitivity possible. Sensitivity to impression involves the engineering of a magnetic aura upon which the highest impressions can play and come into the mind. This magnetic aura, as it were, begins to form the first moment a contact with a soul is made. It deepens and grows as those contacts increase in frequency and become eventually a habitual state of consciousness. Areas of sensitivity appear to pass through three stages. First, sensitivity to impression from other human beings. Secondly, sensitivity to group impressions. The passage of ideas from group to group, the individual can become a receptive agent within any group of which he is a part. And this sensitivity indicates progress on his part. Thirdly, sensitivity to hierarchical impressions from consciousness on higher levels. The mental aura develops rapidly once an individual takes his own development consciously in hand, or once the polarization of the personality is upon the mental plane. The time will come when the mental energy will obscure the emotional or astral energy, and then the soul quality of love will create a substitute. Scientific data about telepathic receiving states. Activation on the parasympathetic nervous system is associated with an increased degree of sensitivity for telepathy. When the parasympathetic system is activated, an increased amount of acetylcholine is released. A sense of traveling clairvoyance is also apparent, as well as relaxation, well-being, and pleasure. The parasympathetic nervous system is mildly motivated by an excess of negative ions in the atmosphere. 
it was found that an excess of negative ions significantly increased telepathic scores over control level scores. It can also be mildly activated by use of the skeletal muscle system. Scientific data has also been gained relative to telepathic scores and breathing. The highest scores in laboratory trials were associated with respiration through the left nostril, charged ions collected on the roof of the nasal passage, and exert a paramagnetic effect on the brain or on the expansion of the psi plasma. Telepathic reception. The first stage of correct telepathic reception is the registering of an impression. It is generally vague in the beginning, but as a thought, idea, purpose, or intention becomes more concrete, it slips into the second stage, which appears as a definite thought form. Finally, that thought form makes its impact on the consciousness of the brain in the location lying just beyond the area between the eyes, constantly, consequently in the area of the pituitary body. It can appear also in the region of the solar plexus center. For those who are conditioned by the elements of the personality, the impression is the factor of importance. Their consciousness is impressed. And so sensitive is their response to the higher impressions that they absorb the impression so that it becomes part of their own energy. Telepathic sending states are characterized by sympathetic nervous system activity. The sympathetic nervous system is activated by adrenaline-like compounds and is antagonistic to the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is associated with the fight-or-flight action or emotional conditions that embody a threat. The telepathic sending states, which are characterized by the use of the sympathetic nervous system, are sometimes referred to as crisis telepathy, which involves a sending individual who is under stress, prompted by need, and carrying a message of biological significance. The literature and folklore of most people include such events. Reports of crisis telepathy are common enough in our own culture. Many people claim to have direct knowledge of sinking of the Titanic. Most of the best evidence comes from less technical, less skeptical cultures, and much of the evidence suggests that crisis calls are not so much broadcast as finely focused. One interested example concerned a Cajun from New Orleans, a tough 32-year-old Creole who joined the crew of a fishing boat working deep waters at the northwest end of the Hawaiian Islands. On the evening in question, they had been troweling, and in a quiet moment, the man decided to go to the crew quarters. As he grabbed the hatch rail, he slipped and fell flat on his back, on the deck below. Nobody saw the accident, and the man lay there paralyzed and in pain. He was convinced that he was about to die and wondered what would come of his young American friend, Millie. He noticed that the time was 9.12 and then passed out. On the main island, 600 miles away, Millie was visiting the home of the boat's captain, passing the evening in a little social embroidery. The wife of the skipper was a full-blooded Samoan who was intent on her needlework, chatting away cheerfully until she felt what she later described as a blow at the back of her head. She slipped semi-conscious into the floor and when she could speak said something very bad was happen has happened on the boat. And then she added, It isn't Bill, her husband. When Millie looked, at the clock at the wall, the time was 9.14, and was not until the early hours of the following morning that the Coast Guard called to tell her that the Creole had been landed in Kauai with a broken back and was being flown home. One aspect of this case is that the sender was a man from a culture which, at least unconsciously, allows for things as this crisis telepathy to happen. The message was intended for a woman whose upbringing made her less receptive, and when she proved unresponsive, it appeared to have been rerouted to another person nearby who was only indirectly involved. 
but whose cultural background and perceptual set made her more sympathetic. Once again, it seems that these things are goal-oriented and not only independent of distance, but also indifferent to route and means. It is only results that matter. There have been cases where several species have worked together in a telepathic manner. J.B. Ryan and Duke University noticed such a case and called it a team effect. In a series of tests on the California beach, Ryan buried a number of small wooden target boxes at random under four inches of the sand that was floated with 12 inches of water as the tide came in. Raking of the sand and subsequent disturbance of the water and wind made it impossible to detect the sights visually and unlikely that the target left olfactory or any other clues to their precise location. Two German Shepherd dogs were able in a series of 203 trials to locate the hidden boxes underwater with a, with a success rate of 38.9%. The odds against them doing so purely by chance were a billion to one. They were able to do this provided that they were accompanied by their trainer and were being observed from a distance and out of sight and hearing by the person who had buried the box. The book Kinship with All Life also relates cases where there is a functional interaction between humans and other species. Factors for successful telepathic work. Successful telepathic work is dependent upon the following factors. First, that there are no barriers existing between the receiver and the broadcaster. Such barriers would be a lack of love or sympathy, criticism, and suspicion. Secondly, that the broadcaster is mainly occupied with the clarity of his symbol, with the word or thought, and not with the receiver. A quick glance towards the receiver, a momentary sending forth of love and understanding, is sufficient to set up the report, and then attention must be paid to the clarity of the symbol. Thirdly, let the receivers think with love and affection of the broadcaster. For, the minute, for a minute or two. Then let them forget that person, the personality. A thread of energy linking receiver and broadcaster has been established and exists. Fourth, let the receivers work with detachment. Much interference and blocking and blockage to thought forms is caused by the receiver producing thought forms and ill-regulated mental energy. Physical theories of how telepathy works. Psi plasma theory. One interesting theory that was put forth about telepathic interaction was that the flow of information needed something to flow on. The theory of a psychic plasma or psi plasma was put forth in the early 1960s by Adrija Puharich. He reason that the body through the behavior of the high potentials contained within the nervous system on a miniature scale, some as high as 3.6 million volts, generated a change in the gravitational constant in the field surrounding the body, a low field in the sending party, and a higher than normal field in the receiving party, permitted within the direction vector created by the intent and thought, a flow of information between the two people. It was a very interesting presentation of data that had a lot of scientific and mathematical basis. Two, the holographic theory. Telepathy is a function of the holographic nature of the structure of the universe. Charles Tart, a professor of psychology at the Davis Campus University of California, did some experiments with hypnosis which indicate a deep holographic interconnectedness between life forms. Tart found two graduate students hypnotized each other in turn, and found that they both went into an altered state in which they both found themselves in the same hallucinated reality. The reality consisted of a beach and an unearth of an unearthly beauty. The sand sparkled like diamonds, and the sea was filled with enormous frothing bubbles. The shoreline was dotted with translucent crystalline rocks pulsing with internal light. The two graduate students set about exploring their newfound world, swimming in the ocean, talking between themselves, and studying the glowing rocks. 
When Tart questioned them about their apparent silence, they told him that in their shared world, they were talking. A phenomena Tart feels involves some kind of paranormal communication between them. In sessions after these, these two students continued to construct various realities and all were as real, available to the senses and dimension, dimensionally realized as anything as they had experienced in their normal waking state. Various worlds constructed in these cases are perfect examples of holographic realities, three-dimensional constructs created out of interconnectedness, sustained by the flow of consciousness, and ultimately as plastic as thought processes that generated it. The realities were three-dimensional, but the space was reportedly more flexible than the space of what people ordinarily experience, and sometimes took on an elasticity the two students had no words to describe. Human consciousness may not be the only thing that participates in the creation of reality fields. Remote viewing experiments have shown that people can accurately describe distant locations even when there are no human observers present at the location. Similarly, subjects can identify the contents of a sealed box randomly selected from a group of sealed boxes and whose contents are therefore completely unknown. This means that we can tap into reality itself to gain information. Consciousness pervades all matter, and meaning has an active presence in both mental and physical worlds. Remote viewing can be looked at as resonance of meaning conveyed from object to mind. In this view, consciousness comprises and includes anything that can generate, receive, or use information. Thus, animals, viruses, DNA, machines, and so-called non-living objects may all may have all the prerequisite properties to take part in the creation of reality. What must be grasped is that all that is is ever-present. What we are concerned with is the constant awakening to that which eternally is and to what is ever-present in the environment. The aim must be to overcome the undue concentration upon the foreground of daily life which characterizes most people. The intense preoccupation with interior states or moods and the lack of sensitivity which characterizes the mass of humanity. Many great teachers have spoken on spoken of a time when nothing secret would remain hidden and when all secrets would be shouted aloud from the rooftops. The growth of telepathic and psychic abilities will eventually tend to strip humanity of the ability to transgress each other without being known for their transgressions. As the race achieves increasingly a mental polarization through a developing attractive power of the mental principle, the use of language from for the conveying of thoughts and communication will fall into disuse. According to some sources, it will take about 500 more years for the race to become consciously telepathic. Telepathy, then, could be viewed as the seed of future racial potency and ability. It is a process which proceeds through a medium of telepathic groups and telepathic people, and through the medium of scientific investigation. This also involves the building of the thought form which will accustom the race to the idea of telepathic work. It is, in the last analysis, the seed of masterhood. Well, I think that concludes chapter one. Later, we will get into chapter two, natural fields and physics. And that will be fun. Well, if you have any uh, comments, stories, ideas, I'd love to hear them in regards to the what we just talked about. Thank you for joining me. Have a great night.